Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, March 12, 2023. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, an Associate Minister at Pleasant Green, and I am the presenter of today's lesson. We're in the spring quarter, and our spring quarter study is entitled, Jesus Calls Us. We're in Unit 1, and our theme for Unit 1, Called from the Margins of Society. This is lesson number two in unit number one. Lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is A Child is Greatest in the Kingdom. In the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults, our lesson title is The Wonder of Childlike Qualities. Devotional reading, Matthew 19, 13 through 22nd verse the background scriptures, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 9, and Mark the 10th chapter, verse 15. Our printed text for today's lesson, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. And the key verse is Matthew 18 and 4 from the New International Version Bible. It reads, Therefore, Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, another opportunity to study your word, to glean from it a message that will help us be more productive in kingdom building as we share the work and the word of the Lord with our fellow man. Thank you, God, for lessons to help us become more and more what you require of your children. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The biblical thread of the spring quarter connects Jesus' earthly ministry as exhibited in passages from all four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the birth of the church following Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension as seen in passages from the book of Acts. Unit 1 is entitled Called from the Margins of Society, is comprised of four lessons that highlight accounts where Jesus disregards artificial societal barriers, choosing instead to reach people on the margins. Lesson one, last week's lesson, was from the book of Luke, and it examined Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, who was restored to a place of honor in his father's home despite his indulgence in life's pleasures that left him destitute. Today's lesson, lesson number two, draws from the book of Matthew. Jesus turns society's preferences upside down as he declares a child as the greatest. So get your Sunday school book, your Bible, pen and notepad and follow along as we go forward with this wonderful lesson. Let's get started. Again, the title of this lesson, The Wonder of Childlike Qualities. The unifying lesson principle is, children are cherished resources with innate qualities and values that often go unappreciated by the larger society. What impedes our ability to be more childlike? Jesus recognized qualities in children that most resemble God's definition of greatness and challenged disciples to relinquish their claims to power or greatness. Three questions to consider for this lesson. Question number one, what does it mean to have childlike faith? Question number two, what was Jesus' stern warning to those who cause weaker believers to sin? And question number three, what should our attitude be about greatness? Let's take a look at the lesson's biblical context. This week's lesson is in the book of Matthew, and he is the author of these writings. It was written especially to his fellow Jewish community to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and to explain God's kingdom. Matthew was a despised Jewish tax collector who became one of Jesus' 12 disciples. His life was changed by the man from Galilee. The original purpose of Matthew's gospel was to prove to the Jews that Jesus Christ 
was the promised Messiah. Matthew presents Jesus as the King of the Jews, the long-awaited Messiah, using a series of Old Testament quotations to document his claims. The message in Matthew forms the connecting link between the Old and New Testament because of its emphasis on the fulfillment of prophecy. The book of Matthew touches on redemption, discipleship, ethics, and morality, the Trinity, Christ's deity, humanity's sinfulness, and salvation as it relates to being part of God's kingdom. This gospel, the gospel of Matthew, can be organized into three broad sections. The presentation of the Messiah, and we see that in Matthew chapter 1 through chapter 4, verse 16. The ministry of the Messiah, and we see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 through chapter 16 and verse 20. And the fulfillment of the Messiah's ministry, and we see that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, through chapter 28, verse number 20. The setting of this week's lesson follows overt rebellion against Jesus and his desire to withdraw from the multitudes to minister to his disciples. This lesson is the fourth of five of Jesus' major discourses recorded by Matthew and establishes humility as the essential virtue for greatness and recognized in his kingdom. This lesson provides a unique platform to teach humility as essential in believers' lives and the faith community. All of us could be humbled in more ways than one. The aims for this week's lesson, one, to acknowledge that those younger than we are sometimes understand God's ways more clearly. Next, nurture openness and humility in your daily walk with Christ. And number three, let go of power and remove any obstacles to following God faithfully. We should not allow anything to interfere with our relationship with God, and we must be faithful in our following of our Father God. As we continue a glimpse into the study of this lesson, there are two lesson outlines in the Adult Pathways Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is humility, the need, and that's in Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 5. And the second outline is humility, the cost, Matthew chapter 18 verses 6 through 9. Let's begin our analysis of the biblical text with the first lesson outline, humility, the need. The disciples had been arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They had the mistaken idea of the definition of greatness and how it is to be achieved. As most Jews anticipated, they supposed that Jesus was preparing to set up a temporal kingdom here on earth, and they desired to know who would occupy the principal positions and prominent posts are positions of honor. Jesus gave his disciples the second prediction of his betrayal and subsequent death in the 17th chapter of Matthew in verses 22 and 23 that reads, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. That's Matthew 17, verses 22 through 23 from the New King James Version. The disciples did not fully comprehend the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection. They did not understand why Jesus kept talking about his death because they expected him to set up a political kingdom. They wanted to know how greatness was assessed and bestowed in God's sight as they were arguing over petty issues. The disciples were thinking of themselves and what positions of prestige were available to them in his future kingdom. Does this sound familiar today? They were so intense to know and be chosen top person that they heatedly argued over who would have what position. Luke 9.46 reads, 
Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. It is something about egos and power and prestige. We see it in our homes, on our jobs, and even in our churches. Key point number one. We are not to be childish like the disciples arguing over petty issues, but rather childlike with humble and sincere hearts. Matthew 18 and 1 from the NIV Bible reads, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? By asking this question, it shows that the disciples had no idea at all what the kingdom of heaven was. Jesus used a child to help his disciples who were being self-centered to get the point. Verses 2 and 3 reads, He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus rebuked their attitudes and overturned their faulty thinking by demonstrating that belonging to his kingdom is conditional to becoming like children. Jesus uses a child as an object lesson to teach his disciples that they had to become like this child, a person of no status, to enter the kingdom of heaven. In this context, Jesus' use of except you be converted, means that the current views and feelings they possessed about the Messiah's kingdom must change. Instead of seeking a place of service, they sought positions of advantage. Instead of asking how can we advance the kingdom of heaven, they were asking what position will we have? Like some people I know today, and you know some too, they need a position in order to function. They're not comfortable being one without position and prestige. Key point number two. Jesus wants us to have a spirit of humility. Verses four and five read, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The disciples were challenged to change their way of thinking. Greatness in the kingdom is based on childlike humility of spirit. The disciples' ideas were wrong or mistaken and misplaced regarding the nature of his kingdom. Jesus taught them that greatness in the kingdom of heaven is reserved for those who reject pride, who accept a child's low social status, and receives and loves others, and who are humble, who are meek, and selfless, having a childlike spirit and is sincere. What a definition. Jesus encouraged the disciples to consider the demeanor of a child. Children possess traits that should characterize a believer's life. Further, in verse 5, Jesus taught that as he showed love and kindness to others, those possessing this same spirit proved their love for him. We must adopt the mindset of Christ. Competitiveness and seeking positions of prestige can negatively impact the witness and ministry of the faith community. Greatness is accepting the role of a servant, not self-recognition. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, serve. Serve with love, serve with humility and kindness. By providing this object lesson, the disciples were challenged to change their way of thinking regarding positions of power, popularity, and prestige and influence in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in God's kingdom is based on childlike humility of spirit, not human effort through competing for positions of power and prestige. God places great value on children. We've got to develop a childlike spirit of humility. Outline number two, humility, the cost. Jesus issued a strong warning to those who cause little ones 
who trust in him to stumble. Verse 6 reads, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. This warning is especially to believers who directly or indirectly lead others to sin. Key point number one, if we cause others to stumble, we will be held accountable. Individuals who tempt others to sin will experience the judgment of God in profound ways. We are to help young people and new believers avoid anything or anyone that could cause them to stumble in their faith and lead them into sin. Jesus continued his rebuke regarding humility by issuing a stern warning to anyone guilty of causing believers with a childlike spirit to sin. Jesus made it clear that the guilty are better off drowned with a heavy millstone around their neck than to face God's judgment. Jesus regards injuring the least mature believer or causing him or her to sin as a serious offense that will be punished accordingly. Verse 7 reads, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. We don't want to be guilty of causing anyone to go astray or to sin. The Bible says, if eating meat in front of my brother is offensive to him, then don't eat meat in front of him. It doesn't mean I can't eat the meat. It's just that I can respect or I should respect the feelings of others if what I am doing is offensive. Woe to the person through whom they come. Jesus explains that because believers are in the world, they will never be free from the temptation to sin but must not be guilty of tempting others to sin. Those individuals found guilty will experience God's judgment because they refused to deal with the fundamental cause of their sins. Key point number two, any relationship, practice, or activity that leads to sin should be stopped. We do not want to be a stumbling block to anyone. Believers must recognize that it is possible to offend or harm vulnerable believers in several other ways than the temptation to sin, and these include disparaging remarks and attitudes, refusing to forgive and restore, and a lack of genuine concern for their needs and feelings. Verse 8 says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Jesus is saying here that it is better to go to heaven with one hand than to hell with both. Verse 9 says, And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Jesus used the example of how the disciples should cut off a hand, pluck out an eye, if they encourage someone to sin by their actions. He used these examples to show that anything they do that does not reflect his image of love and care must be stopped. This applies to us today. We need to take a hard look at what we do, how we live, what we say, and how we influence others. Jesus tells us to perform spiritual surgery by honestly acknowledging, confessing, and forsaking sin in our lives to prevent causing others to stumble. We are to get rid of that sin that causes others to stumble. Jesus tells the disciples it would be better for them to go to heaven crippled or blind than to sin and cause someone else to miss his or her opportunity to go to heaven. That, my brothers and sisters, is worthy of consideration, rethinking, and rethinking again. In summary, in this lesson, Jesus clearly defines the true meaning of greatness. 
He taught his disciples a completely different view of greatness. Instead of pride, Jesus emphasized having humility. Instead of aggressiveness, he emphasized childlikeness. Instead of disorder, he emphasized having self-control. True greatness is determined by one's willingness to humble himself or herself and display a spirit of meekness as he or she participates in the mission of God. Greatness in the Bible is never determined by how much money someone has or how much influence or power one claims to have. Greatness is always associated with the one who is a servant. By biblical standards, our greatness is determined by our willingness to serve. Dr. Martin Luther King said, If you want to be great, be a servant. I salute and I stand by that even today. Our closing thought and question. The old nature desires power, position, and prestige. Becoming childlike in faith requires embracing a different agenda and set of values than most people in the world. Question. If God has trusted you with a position that gives you status in your earthly organization, how does it affect your attitude and behavior? Let us pray. Father God, we find ourselves sometimes at the disposal of the challenges and problems of life. Help us to have the humility of a child as we seek to maneuver through these challenges. Please, Father, give us a spirit of helping, forgiving, and encouraging to others, realizing that all of our help comes from you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.